Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, U.S. military bases all over the world and what the heck are they doing there? Our guest, David Vine, is professor of anthropology at American University. His books include Base Nation, How U.S. Military Bases Abroad Harm America and the World, and his latest, which is just out in paperback, The United States of War, A Global History of America's Endless Conflicts from Columbus to the Islamic state. You can find him at davidvine.net, and you can find an online book club he's about to do at worldbeyondwar.org slash book clubs. David Vine, welcome back to Talk World Radio. David Swanson, it's really a, always a pleasure to talk to you. So I, 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 I want to talk about your book, but uh, a war is just ending, supposedly, hopefully. Uh, do some bases get closed when a war ends? They do, although I think I would start by saying that the war is not ending in multiple senses. The war, of course, no matter what happens on the ground in terms of violent conflict, will not be over for Afghans for years and years, generations really, of course, because of the way that war affects people through generations, trickles down generations, as, as some might say. Uh, but U.S. involvement in the war is also very much unclear. Uh, the Biden administration has indicated it wants to and plans to uh, intend, uh, uh, it, it plans to remain involved in a quote unquote over the horizon fashion, meaning it will strike in Afghanistan with uh, the help of U.S. military bases in the wider Middle East, in the wi wider region. And um, this certainly suggests that, that by that means alone, the United States will remain fighting in Afghanistan. There are also signs that it, uh, and it's highly likely there'll be an ongoing CIA presence. There may be a military contractor presence. There may be a special forces presence. So the, I think it's, it's quite premature to say the U.S. war in Afghanistan is over. Uh, and of course, uh, as your, your question indicates, despite the closure of, of U.S. bases in Afghanistan, uh, there remain dozens of U.S. bases in the wider region. I, I think there were maybe 11 bases in Afghanistan last time I heard uh, data probably from you. Um, you're our, our expert on this. Uh, do those special forces and CIA still on the ground but unacknowledged in Afghanistan need a, a base or two? They need a base somewhere. Uh, I, I, I haven't seen confirmation that the, there are special forces troops or the CIA is remaining in Afghanistan. In fact, the New York Times did some reporting about a CIA base that was abandoned. Uh, the U.S. left Bagram. It left, of course, the, its last de facto base was the international airport in Kabul. Uh, but there are certainly bases in, in surrounding countries and in the wider region. And we need to, uh, for those of us who, and I, I think there are a growing number who are understanding that the war in Afghanistan needed to end, that the Biden administration chose the right decision uh, by ending the formal withdrawal, ending the formal involvement in Afghanistan, we need to push for an end to all the endless wars, an end to all of the U.S. military uh, activity in the Middle East, uh, because it's now been uh, going on more than 40 years that the United States has been uh, meddling with its military and meddling, it puts it lightly, uh, and destabilizing the region and causing massive death and destruction in the process. In the in these 40 years or more, David Vine, or even just in the 20 years that everyone is marking uh, from September 11th, 2001, uh, what's what's changed in the way of U.S. military bases around the world? My impression is that they have been multiplying. I'll just start by saying that the United States has more military bases, foreign military bases, that is military bases outside the 50 states in Washington, D.C., on other people's lands, more than any people, country, or empire in world history. Now, this has been the case since World War II. The number of bases in that time has fluctuated, gone up and down. Um, at times, there have been thousands of bases. And indeed, in the past 20 years, there have been upwards of 2,000 
foreign U.S. bases, and that was at the height of the U.S. wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. Currently, by my best estimate, along with two colleagues, Leah Bolger and Patterson Deppin, we estimate there are 750 U.S. military bases abroad, 750 U.S. military bases abroad in 80 foreign countries and colonies. This is a very large number. Again, it, we, we think it remains the more than any people or empire or country in world history. Uh, and, it, and just to put it in further comparison, uh, further context, the rest of the world's countries combined at most probably have 200 foreign bases. And this is m mostly Britain, which by some recent reporting has 145 foreign bases. The rest of the world's countries have a uh, few dozen together. Uh, so 750 bases is massive, and it's actually more than three times the number of U.S. embassies and consulates. Uh, this is the face of U.S. foreign policy. This is how the U.S. engages with the world, by and large, through its military bases and, sadly, in the last 20 years, through war. And, and yet there, there's all this talk of a war ending and it seems that everyone from the White House through Congress and both political parties uh, is pretty intent on military spending going up. Um, you know, what, are the, what are the prospects for closing a few more of these bases before they, they start another war? Well, I'm, I'm encouraged that there are a growing number of people in Congress and, and beyond Congress who realize that we need to dramatically cut the military budget and move are spending from war and the military to meet real human needs, um, human needs that have been neglected for so long. We can begin with, with COVID. I mean, how many, literally hundreds of thousands of lives in the United States alone could we have saved if we had invested properly in pandemic preparedness, in vaccine production capacity, in PPE, rather than pouring in in terms of our post 9-11 wars alone, $8 trillion into these wars and total military spending since 2001 of $21 trillion, which $1 trillion is, is incomprehensible. $21 trillion really requires us to do some work. But this shows us where our priorities have been. And again, I, I think there are a growing number of people in Congress who are realizing that our priorities have been so far out of whack it, 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 it's, it's shameful and, and beyond sad, again, because of the people who have suffered as a result of this misallocation of funds. When it comes to bases abroad, I think there's also growing uh, consensus among some, a growing, uh, among a growing number of people across the political spectrum, that the U.S. military has had far too many military bases abroad for far too long, that this has been an unquestioned policy since the end of World War II and the early days of the Cold War, and that these bases are not keeping us safer. They're not keeping us safer because of the money we're not investing elsewhere, like in pandemic preparedness or building a green infrastructure that could save us from global warming and climate change. Uh, it's not going to education, uh, addressing hunger, homelessness, so many needs that are being neglected, but also it's distracting our military from protecting the United States, the borders of the United States, and it's been a launch pad for war. And that brings me to my, my greatest fear is indeed that despite the formal end of the U.S. war in Afghanistan, that we're going to end up in another Afghanistan. A Afghanistan and Iraq and all the post 9-11 wars, the war on terror, that is for those of us who grew up in the post-Vietnam era, that is our Vietnam. I don't think enough people really realize that, 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 that the past 20 years of war have been our Vietnam for a whole variety of reasons, mostly because the, the government has done a good job of disguising these wars, wars and, and hiding them in a, in a variety of ways. But the, the, yeah. death, the death toll, the toll of displacement, the toll of injury is comparable to that in Vietnam and Laos and Cambodia. Uh, and my greatest fear is that we're going to end up in another Afghanistan, another Iraq, another Vietnam, if we don't start closing bases abroad and dramatically shrinking the size of the military budget, which ends up in the coffers of the military, industrial, congressional complex.
uh, David Vine, your new book, uh, which I highly recommend to everyone, is called The United States of War, A Global History of America's Endless Conflicts from Columbus to the Islamic State. And I think it makes a couple of key points that it would be great for you to expand on. Uh, one is that this country, the United States, is always at war. There's not peacetime and wartime. There's just wartime. And the other is that is is the documentation that the bases correlate with a greater likelihood of war. You put bases in a place and you're more likely to get wars, whereas I think some people think just the opposite, that the bases discourage wars, prevent wars, make wars less likely. Can you talk about those points? Yes, the claim that's often made by some politicians, some so-called leaders, has been that the United States needs bases abroad, needs hundreds of bases abroad and hundreds of thousands of troops abroad to keep us safe, to ensure peace and stability and security around the world. And this is just a complete fabrication, I, I would say, to put it mildly. Um, indeed, the, the RAND Corporation, which is a government-funded think tank and hardly a group of lefties, they have their research has shown that there is a correlation between the presence of U.S. bases abroad and the U.S. launching offensive war. And, and that's in the, the post-World War II era. My book, The United States of War, shows that through U.S. history, the U.S. military began building bases abroad shortly after independence, that these bases were on the lands of Native American peoples, of course, and they enabled the expansion and conquest and colonization by the United States of lands across North America, killing and dispossessing literally millions of Native American peoples in the process. And that through the rest of U.S. history, the presence of U.S. bases abroad has also served as a launch pad for war in a process that often looks like bases abroad are built. They lead to wars, which then lead to the often to the acquisition and construction of yet more bases abroad, which lead to more war, which lead to more bases, which lead to more war in an ongoing process. And this is what we have to we have to break this cycle. Um, we put simply, we, we have to stop fighting. If we don't stop fighting, my, my greatest, greatest fear is that we will not only end up in another Vietnam, another Afghanistan, another Iraq, we will end up in a far more catastrophic war uh, that will make the death toll of 4.5 million people who've died in the post 9-11 wars, by my estimate, will make that and the tens of millions injured, the 38 million people displaced since 2001, the death toll of a future war, the displacement toll, the injury toll could be far, far worse. As long as there are nuclear weapons, it could indeed be far, far worse. Um, David Vine, what about the, the question of how many years of the existence of the United States it's been at war? Because I, I get hysterical emails about the 78% of the days of the United States it's been at war, or 83% or 91%. What's the, what's the correct number? In some ways, I, I think getting bogged down in the numbers is, is probably a mistake. I, I think, you know, the title of my book, I, I think, puts it right that, that the United States has become a United States of wars, become a, a nation, a country defined by war in profound ways. And our lives have been defined by war, beginning with the, the military spending, the military budget that is upwards of $1 trillion a year, if you include money for the Pentagon, the military, uh, the nuclear weapons, other parts of, of, of the war machine. Uh, but in, in my book, I show that the United States has been fighting in some form of war or other combat in all but 11 years in U.S. history. So that's about 95 year, percent of the years in U.S. history, 234 out of 245 years in the U.S. history, the U.S. military has been fighting. And and I, I think I think that the important point is that 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 the military has been such an important part of our policy of what this nation does um, and has come to shape our lives in profound ways, both seen and unseen. Do you recall which 11 years those were? I'd like to figure out what they did right. <laughs> so, so in my book, I, I have uh, both a list of all the countries that the United States has invaded or gone to war with 
um, including you know, the U.S. has invaded Mexico 10 times, Canada 11 times, Panama 24 times. I'll read it just a few others just to give people a sense. Cuba, the Philippines, yeah. uh, Hawaii, Apache, Greece, the Seminole, Tripoli, uh, Peru, Vietnam, Cambodia, Yemen, Kenya, Syria, Niger, Libya, and the list goes on and on. I also have a list of all the years. The years, you know, by, by, by many accounts, the United States has never been at peace. Um, and depending on how you define war, that, that is surely the, the case. But uh, by my somewhat conservative estimate to avoid any uh, accusation of exaggeration, uh, and I, I, I base my list on a Congressional Research Service report that's issued annually that details and documents all the U.S. wars and, and other forms of combat. The years are at the end of the 19th century, in the 1930s, when President Roosevelt stopped a, a long pattern of U.S. invading and occupying Latin American countries. Um, and so in the, in the 1930s, before World War II, um, a couple years possibly in the 1950s, and then um, at the end of the 1970s under Pre President Carter. So still dealing weapons and supporting coups and assisting militaries around the globe, but not engaging in its own uh, war directly would be the in, Indeed, the in, involved in all, yeah. other forms of violence, surely. But I, I think um, the periods uh, during FDR's administration and during President Carter's administration, uh, before he be began a massive buildup of military bases and forces in the Middle East, there were attempts to transform U.S. policy, not just attempts, but but there was substantive change in U.S. foreign policy and war policy. And that's what we need again. Mm -hmm. uh, under President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, he had, in addition to his New Deal, he had what his foreign policy was defined by, the, by what he called the good neighbor policy. And I, I think we need a new good neighbor policy. And that would be a policy uh, defined by a complete opposition to armed intervention, a complete opposition to any intervention in the foreign or domestic affairs of other nations. And other nations around Latin America agreed to the principles of this good neighbor policy. Uh, and I think we need to ask politicians, uh, are you opposed to military intervention, military invasions and war in other countries? War should not be a legitimate policy option for the United States, period. I mean, it shouldn't be a legitimate policy option for any nation, period. But given the catastrophic effects of the last 20 years of war alone, the fact that any U.S. leaders can think about, can contemplate, can plan for future U.S. wars is, is indeed part of the problem, that, that their consciousness is such that they can contemplate using the U.S. military in such a way. That the United States foreign policy must be defined by a dedication to peace building, to violence reduction and the avoidance of war rather than any future war making. Uh, very well said. Uh, David Vine, the, the book looks at a number of impacts that these bases have, uh, and it seems to me there are a number of ways that they make wars more likely. Um, they require the troops and the weapons to fill the bases with, uh, which builds up that military industrial complex. They generate blowback, attack on themselves, which then you can, you know, have a defensive attack on somebody thousands of miles away because they attacked you. Uh, they form alliances between the U.S. government and other war prone, brutal governments that, that house these bases. Uh, so it, it seems that if you wanted to have fewer wars, uh, this would be an easy first step. Would be to get rid of these bases. We have, we have all, we have a lot of, of, of noise in the activist community with the war on Afghanistan ending and estimates of what the wars cost about cutting the money for the wars. Uh, but if we're not going to cut the money for the bases, we're going to get more wars, aren't we? I think yes. I think both have to be uh, the priority of of, of any peace-loving uh, people in our country of the anti-war movement and, and anyone who wants to see a more peaceful country and more peaceful world and, and a country dedicated to, to caring for, for the people in, in this country and, and, and around the world. We need to both 
dramatically cut the size of the, the military budget and close bases abroad in particular. Um, and closing bases abroad will save money. Um, it will also benefit the local economies of, of states and, and congressional districts uh, where U.S. military personnel and their families come back from bases in Germany and Italy and Japan and South Korea and Honduras and the list goes on, the 80 countries and colonies where, where U.S. troops are, are located. Um, we need to both close bases and dramatically shrink the size of the, the military budget because what we have now, despite the formal end of the U.S. war in Afghanistan, is a, a, effectively a self-perpetuating system of war that has, uh, especially given the dramatically increased power of the military industrial congressional complex since the days when Eisenhower identified it. Uh, it's created a system where too many people are making too much money and benefiting, uh, beginning with the, the arms manufacturers um, from war to, to cut off the, the, the supply of war. Um, meanwhile, these bases, as you pointed out, bases abroad just make it too easy for policymakers to, to choose war, to launch wars. Uh, and we need to, yes, in short, put an end to this, this system of war, this self-perpetuating system of war that has benefited a small few and a, a few others who have benefited from the crumbs of the military industrial congressional complex through jobs um, and, and, and build, as my book says, a United States of peace. People, uh, people around the world do put up resistance to these bases sometimes, proposed bases, existing bases, get them closed or, or prevent their construction. There were people in, in Montenegro in recent months who prevented the, the construction of a new NATO base there. Um, where, where are people finding traction? Uh, what's working, if anything? Uh, to close down any of these bases through through activism or through the U.S. Congress. Yeah, it, 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 it often is very difficult to, to close bases abroad, uh, but it's important to note that people have been successful in the past 20 years alone. The people of Vieques, Puerto Rico, probably most uh, prominently or most well-known to many listeners, um, kick the Navy out. Uh, in Hawaii as well, the Navy was forced to leave one of the Hawaiian islands where they did similar kinds of, uh, excuse me, uh, weapons testing as, as the Navy conducted in Vieques. Uh, the people of Okinawa, while they haven't been successful in closing uh, the base that has drawn the most ire and the most dangerous base in the world, as, as many call it, uh, they have significantly shrunk the size of, of the U.S. military presence on Okinawa. Um, Okinawa, of course, the the part of Japan that has the vast majority of, of U.S. military presence, um, where they're across Japan, there are about 119 U.S. military base sites. Uh, the vast majority are in Okinawa, and people there have been protesting for more than 20 years, 25 years uh, in particular, and, and really since World War II, um, but 25 years of, of dedicated struggle. And it has borne fruit in the, in the sense of the U.S. military returning land and bases to the government and people of Okinawa. So there are examples we can draw on, examples from Europe, um, the African countries and movements, social movements, uh, civil society uh, blocked the creation of, of a headquarters for the US Africa Command um, in the George W. Bush administration. Although surreptitiously, the US has built up a military presence and base presence you know, throughout the African continent. Um, so it's it's a complicated story, but people are struggling valiantly uh, to either close U.S. bases abroad or or block the construction of new ones. Has, has anyone done a poll of the U.S. public? Uh, I have to imagine if anyone would, that there would be a, a good number of people who would like uh, to close some bases, especially if they were told uh, what they cost financially. Indeed, I, I don't think most people realize that U.S. bases abroad, just the infrastructure, just the, the physical bases themselves to run and maintain them on a yearly basis costs 50, by my estimate, $51.5 billion a year, $51.5 billion a year. And that doesn't include the costs of the, the troops that are stationed on these bases, which brings the total uh, to about at least $20 billion more, um, perhaps, perhaps even more. Um, 
50, but just $51.5 billion a year spent on maintaining the infrastructure while our infrastructure at home, of course, crumbles in so many ways. Our, our bridges, our roads, our public transportation, our water and electricity infrastructure. Uh, we have let these infrastructures crumble while building up this very robust and substantial military infrastructure abroad that we don't need and that isn't making us safer. I think indeed, if people knew, more people would be opposed. Most people have no clue that the US military has 750 bases abroad in 80 countries and colonies. Uh, I haven't seen the latest uh, polling data. Uh, a lot depends on how you ask the question. And, um, but but I, I think uh, our task as people concerned about these issues is to make people more aware of uh, these basic facts of how the U.S. engages with the world. I, I don't, I think it, it's clear that people would prefer to engage uh, culturally, socially, economically um, than to engage through war and military bases, which has been the predominant form of, of engagement uh, that the, the United States has, has pursued really since independence, but, but uh, especially in the last 20 years of, of endless war. It, it, it seems to me we have just a few minutes left, David Vine. One of the biggest problems is that this issue isn't in the U.S. media as a topic for debate. I, the other day, the New York Times had a survey of 20 questions, and it would put you into one of six categories if the U.S. had six political parties. But all six political parties were guaranteed to have absolutely no opinions on foreign policy, the budget, wars, international law, peace, 96 percent of humanity. Just not mentioned at all. It's just not there. Um, am I right that this is the big hurdle? Getting it into the consciousness of, of people indeed is a, a, a big hurdle, including the, and, and perhaps especially the news media, because of course the news media then shapes the consciousness of, of others. But I do think this is an opportunity with the attention to Afghanistan, the attention that is long deserved, uh, the attention of course, first and foremost on the people of Afghanistan. And, and, and there is, I, 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 this is also encouraging, I think, uh, growing empathy and, and support for Afghan refugees, the uh, nearly, and actually now surely more than 6 million people who've been displaced in Afghanistan since the U.S. invaded and began its war in Afghanistan in 2001. Uh, there, there is growing support. I, I guess I would point to one other encouraging sign that I, I think we shouldn't lose sight of. There was a huge anti-war movement that, that began in the days after 9-11. I think the 20th anniversary of the attacks of 9-11 and the beginning of the war on terror is another opportunity we must seize to make people more aware of the choices that have been made in our names and with our tax dollars. Yep. Um, but I think it's important to point out as we do that, that the anti-war movement, some think it was a failure because the war in Afghanistan happened, the war in Iraq happened. I don't, I don't see it that way. Those wars did happen. Um, but the anti-war movement that, that grew up in the days after 9-11 and said, do not go to war, that agreed with Barbara Lee, the one member of Congress who stood up and opposed yep. the war in Afghanistan. Um, this led to a seconds this, left. this led to a, a massive shift in U.S. public opinion against war, such that no president today could launch a major ground invasion and major war. Um, this is a success of the war movement, among others. Couldn't agree movement. more. Very Excuse well me. said, uh, David Vine. His book is uh, "The United States of War," and if you want to be in a book club with David Vine and ask him all the questions I failed to ask him, uh, go to worldbeyondwar.org/slash/bookclubs. David, thank you very much for coming on Talk World Radio. David, it was really a pleasure. Thank you for having me. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.